let's build on what we talked about yesterday and um, go into a little more detail about um, about drill bits. So um, during our last session, we talked a little bit about the anatomy of twist bits, and we talked about how they can be resharpened. Um, and that the angle can be modified when you're resharpening those twist bits uh, to accommodate uh, different types of materials. So uh, in general, um, general purpose drill bits are sharpened to uh, uh, approximately 118 degrees relative to the point. And they, they make accessories called drill bit sharpening guides that can be used um, to get a more accurate point of reference of what those degrees are. Um, metalworking bits are typically sharpened to around 135 degrees, um, which is more obtuse. Um, and then um, you will often find woodworking bits as acute or as pointed as 80 degrees in plastic bits um, will be as sharp as 60 degrees, uh, but will often have the, the end of the point on the drill bit flattened um, uh, to minimize cracking of that material. So um, twist bits also come in a range of different lengths. They make them an extra short, they make them an extra long. So um, we also talked a bit um, during our last session about paddle bits and about how um, we talk about these as reduced shank bits. These paddle bits are spade bits. Uh, really inexpensive way to make larger diameter holes and there are extensions that you can get to go along with them so that you can go through um, longer lengths of material um, and uh, pretty easy to resharpen. We also talked about how you can uh, put a piece of tape or mark a line with a Sharpie on there to control uh, the depth that you're going into those materials. Um, we looked a little bit about uh, we looked a little bit at Forstner bits, which are significantly more expensive than paddle bits. But again, it gives us something that's a reduced shank that allows us to work with a, a drill chuck um, that um, may be limited or restricted in, in to how large a, a shank or shaft it can accommodate. Um, it also has a center point on the Forstner bits which um, allow it to be guided more accurately through the material so it's less prone to wander or grab onto grain. Um, um, here we see a combination of, um, of those characteristics of a brad point, I'm sorry, of a, of a um, twist bit um, with a brad point that helps uh, keep that bit centered and makes it less prone to wandering or grabbing. And you'll also notice that the flutes on this particular bit, when you compare those to a standard twist bit, it's a much, what we call, faster flute. It moves down the length faster, which helps it eject material more readily, which with wood, you're typically removing that material much more rapidly than you would be uh, with something like a twist bit. Um, uh, there are also what are called um, shaft collars or stop collars that can be affixed to drill bits to restrict or limit their depth of penetration in the material. Um, we looked at fixed length combination countersinks, variable length combination countersinks, um, VIX bits or hinged bits, which have the, um, the spring-loaded collar that retracts to maintain that um, center on larger openings that are found on um, hinges and on um, uh, mounted hardware like this. Um, we talked a little bit about um, step bits and how they're exceptionally useful for going through thinner gauge material, um, but they are a little bit expensive uh, when compared to uh, things like twist bits. But, you know, you're getting in effect, you know, in this particular twist bit, you're getting 12 different sizes that you're able to achieve in thin gauge sheet metal with that uh, one bit. Uh, this is also a good example of um, coated bits. So uh, here we have black oxide, and that black oxide comes from the heat treatment of the drill bits. And, and I want to make sure and get back to that, but um, this particular bit is not just fancy gold to look pretty. It has a coating that's a titanium nitrite coating that is on the outside of the bit that uh, reduces the wear uh, uh, 
that increases the wear resistance, so those tend to stay sharper a lot longer. Um, we looked at hole saws, and um, we didn't really go into a lot of detail about these, but better quality hole saws are made up of uh, two parts. One is the, the mandrel, and the other is the, the, um, the saw itself. Uh, these come in a wide range of sizes, and again, uh, a really um, uh, pretty useful for making large diameter holes in um, thinner gauge sheet metal. I generally wouldn't use these in material any thicker than a, a quarter inch plate. Um, and really, more than anything else, they were designed for contractors to be able to knock holes through drywall or knock holes through uh, sheet metal to be able to run tubular materials through those like conduit or plumbing or pipe. Um, also, uh, well, uh, I talked a little bit about center punches, but we didn't look at center punches. So center punches come in a range of different um, sizes. Uh, so uh, this particular center punch is, um, is uh, one that is used with a hammer. And so typically when you make a mark on your material, you bring your center punch up alongside of it so you have a clear view of that mark on the surface and then you raise it up into position and that creates the dimple in the material that will um, help the drill bit find exactly where you want it to go and minimize the wandering or scrolling on the surface. Um, for lighter gauge material, I really like uh, spring-loaded center punches. Again, they're relatively inexpensive, and they can be adjusted by turning clockwise or counterclockwise to increase or decrease uh, the spring tension that determines um, how deep that punch mark penetrates into the material. But again, this is really useful for thinner gauge material because it's less prone to uh, bend or deform um, the material than is a, a rigid center punch like this that's used with a hammer. Um, again, uh, remember, anytime we're drilling through metal, we're always gonna be using uh, either a wax-based lubricant or a petroleum product like this three-in-one oil or a water-soluble oil. Um, we, I, I also would like to take this opportunity to introduce uh, masonry bits because we talked about the function of this drill as being capable of um, drilling through wood and metal, but we really didn't talk that much about the, ha uh, the hammer drill function, which, is, which allows us to be able to um, drill through um, cementious materials so that could be concrete block, it could be mortar joints, it could be uh, brick, it could be some softer ceramic bodies. Um, and uh, it is a combination of a high-speed steel uh, shank, and then it has a small bit of carbide, which is a, uh, an, an alloyed steel that has very high resistance to wear and can also sustain impact. And the reason that it's designed this way is that when you're going through highly abrasive materials um, like um, stone or, uh, or through mortar joints or brick, um, that material is really, it would wear out a standard twist bit in a matter of two turns of that drill. Um, so that carbide uh, tip that's brazed into the end of this high-speed steel shank is um, it's engineered or designed to be able to do two things. One, to rub that abrasive material out of the way, um, but when it comes to cement, we, have, we not only have that abrasive matrix that's made out of uh, cement and sand, but we often find that there's also aggregate in there in the form of either pea gravel or, or gravel that's suspended in that matrix, and that pea gravel is really, really too hard for most drill bits to get through. So that's where the, the hammer function of the hammer drill comes into play. When I turn that into the hammer function, it's giving me both the rotation of the drill and also a camming action that is moving the drill bit forward and backwards so that the carbide is when it comes in contact with those bits of aggregate, it can shatter that aggregate and, and clear them out of the way. So, um, and, and uh, uh, 
unlike um, when we're drilling with um, uh, metal or, or, or trying to get up to a larger hole drilling with wood or metal, um, where wood, we can frequently go directly to the size of bit that we need. Uh, metal, we're stepping up, stepping up incrementally from a smaller size that gives us an accurate point of location to larger sizes to get to that um, uh, uh, finished diameter. Uh, with masonry bits, typically we're going directly to the size masonry bit that our finished hole size is going to be. And we'll do a little demo in um, using the hammer drill function of this uh, cordless drill. And last but not least, uh, another specialty bit are these um, spear point bits that are used for ceramic and that um, also work well for glass. Um, but much like um, drilling in metal, which generates a lot of heat um, and can result in the um, dulling of our drill bits from excessive heat uh, bearing on those drill bits. Um, when we're drilling through glass, it's absolutely imperative that we're dissipating that heat with, uh, uh, with a cutting fluid. Um, or you could, uh, sometimes you can have moderate success by just using water. So one way to apply water directly to the area that you're drilling would be with a constant stream from a spray bottle. Um, the other technique is that you could build a dam around the area that you're drilling with um, oil, clay, or plasticine, fill that with water, and then um, that keeps it lubricated, wet, and cool as you're drilling through it that minimizes the chance of that glass cracking. And uh, so, uh, we'll try to do a little demonstration of drilling holes in glass and um, so you get a chance to see how that works.